and uh, good morning to everyone. Hey, I said good morning, huh? <laughs> good morning, everyone. She, she said, she said good morning. <laughs> I would like to thank Sounds of Isha for this wonderful and mesmerizing performance. And <laughs> on behalf of IIT Kharagpur, I welcome the man of great prominence who has taken upon empowering the mankind with his knowledge and wisdom, Sadhguru. I thank him and his entire team for coming all the way to IIT Kharagpur for having this interaction with us. Thank you, Sadhguru. Mm -hmm. And now, without any further delay, we'll start with the questions which IIT Kharagpur is keen to ask to you. And before that, I give my introduction. Hello everyone, I'm Shreya Satra, a third year undergraduate from the Department of Electrical Engineering. Hello everyone, my name is Idris Islahi. I'm a third year undergraduate of uh, the Department of Industrial Systems Engineering, IIT Kharagpur. Good afternoon one and all. My name is Siddharth Menon. I'm a final year undergraduate student of the Department of Architecture and Regional Planning. Here we begin with our first question. So Sadhguru, the first question is, um, You've been traveling all around the world, meeting many number of people and affecting as well as helping their lives for the past 35 years as far as I hear. In all these years, you may have affected millions of lives. I feel it's also the government's responsibility to take good care of people and to help them. So my question is, why, why don't you establish a political party and run for the people's representative. Well, uh, we have a very distorted perception of what is politics, unfortunately, largely in the world, particularly in India. If something… if you do something wrong, we say, oh, he's doing politics. See what he's trying to push me into <laughs> But the real perspective of this is, politics means it's about policy making. That means you set the direction for the nation as to where the nation should go, what it should achieve, where people should get, essentially directing the ship. Why if you look at a nation has a journey, we are going somewhere, somebody has to captain it. Well, I think it is one of the most significant things that needs to be done in the world in a most responsible and sensitive way. Well, unfortunately, a whole lot of them have not earned this, that today it's become like this, if you utter the word politics, it looks like we are talking about something dirty. It's, it's almost like that. So having said that, you okay? I tell you a joke, it's all right. You're serious, man, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> this happened. Three men who are in their older age who are retired. One was a, a surgeon, another was a general, another was a politician. They met in the old age home. And uh, they had a golf game, it went all bad. So they thought at least they'll have some good gossip. Bad game, what to do? At least good gossip. So they started this and then they said, uh, the surgeon said, of all the professions, the most important profession is that of a surgeon because it is only by cutting the Adam's one rib and making woman out of it, that this whole world happened. So what can be more significant than that? Surgeon's profession is the most important profession. 
in the world. So the general said, oh come on, it is clearly said that there was chaos and then order had to be brought in before this rib surgery happened. And who else but a general can bring order? Obviously we were before you and only because we brought order, you could do this surgery. The politician said, you guys are getting it all wrong, but who created the chaos? <laughs> Well, that's not how it should be. That's not what politics means. Politics means sorting out problems, not creating problems. So, why should I not start a new party? You didn't tell me to join the existing ones at least, that's a good thing <laughs> So, it looks like I have at least a thousand oats here <laughs> but that's not going to get you anywhere. But that's not the point. The point is this, there are two dimensions to human life. One is arranging the external situations, which is in a way policy maker's business. And another is settling the interiority of the human being. In this culture, we have always held settling the interiority of the human being far more important than arranging the outside. Because however well you arrange it, still if you are not organized well within yourself, still your life will be a mess. See, all of you, I'm telling you, I'm sure in IIT Kharagpur, uh, there are twelve thousand students, there must be at least twenty-four thousand complaints. <laughs> Hello <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, Compared to any other generation ever in the history of humanity, you and me are living in the highest level of comfort and convenience and empowerment. Isn't it so? Isn't it so? But still, no generation has ever whined the way we are whining all the time. We are not enjoying this organization. Never before in human history, human survival was this well organized as it is today. So this is the time for a human being to organize the inner aspect of you so that the external organization doesn't go waste. Why I'm saying this is, already there's enough proof in the world that people can mess up the most best organization on the outside, can be messed up by internal things. Thirty-eight percent, thirty-eight percent of the European population is on psychiatric medication. Why I'm picking on the European population is, this is a society which has enjoyed longest period of economic and material well-being on this planet right now. Almost nearly uh, two hundred years they've enjoyed material well-being like no other society in the world. How they got that material is another matter, I don't want to go into that <laughs> okay. But they have enjoyed material well-being for so long, and thirty-eight percent, if you just withdraw a few medicines from the marketplace, the nation or the… all those nations can go crazy tomorrow morning. Yes? If pharmaceuticals go on strike, really, everybody goes crazy, how is this? You call this well-being? So one must understand, just organizing the external situations is not growing, going to bring human well-being. You can organize comfort. You can organize convenience, you can organize survival, you cannot organize well-being. Well-being is something that you have to earn within yourself. I've taken it upon myself to bring human well-being because this is inner organization of yourself. This is very important, otherwise all the bounty that the science and technology has offered us will go waste. And this bounty has not come free. Let's say we're sitting in the comfort of this hall right now. If this hall has to come up, come up, every worm, insect, bird, animal, plant, tree has suffered, isn't it? Yes or no? For every convenience that you and me are enjoying, haven't every other creature on this planet suffered immensely? Hello? And when we cause so much suffering, at least we must be well. 
we sit in this comfort and we are miserable, we had no business to cause suffering to them, isn't it? In pursuit of our well-being, we did all this in the world. Are we really well? We are the most comfortable generation ever. But can we claim we are the most joyful generation ever? Unfortunately, no, isn't it? That's what I'm trying to change. So, uh, politics, there are so many people eager to do, we need to change them. <laughs> that being in politics is not of personal ambition, but towards nation's well-being. This context we have to change in them, it is not a profession, it is a certain service that you have to render. So if this context changes in their minds and hearts, which we are trying to change, <laughs> that will be bigger than me starting another party. I think there are too many parties. <laughs> Even the EVM uh, machine is complaining because <laughs> there are not enough slots for all the parties. They are not able to find enough symbols. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, bicycle is okay, it's a common man's vehicle, but uh, anything and anything, you know, there are gas cylinder, there's a broom and there is a whatever, <laughs> all kinds of things because they're not even able to find symbols. What symbol would you give me? <laughs> so, he says, turban, <laughs> then only the Sardarjis will vote for me <laughs> So there is no need for one more political party, I would say there should be reduction of political parties in the country <laughs> to two or three or four, not uh, two hundred parties. It's just confusing the people, they don't even know whom to vote for. Because your chacha has started a party, how can you not vote for it? <laughs> you… <laughs> You don't know what is his ideology, you don't know what is his policy, what is his vision for the nation, nothing but he's your chacha <laughs> So if I start, all the millions of people who are in some way drawn to me, they will not know what is my vision, why I want to start this political party. Sadhguru, we will vote him <laughs> I don't want to bring that nonsense. <laughs> Sadhguru, I see myself uh, relentlessly pursuing goals with a kind of a go-getter's attitude at times. And in other times, I am deliberately very patient and I wait for things to unfold in their own unique and beautiful way. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having… What is it? You're talking about your love affair or your profession? <laughs> And uh, I've had the pleasure of having wonderful experiences in both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I would like to ask you is, according to you, what is a better approach to things? But where did you find this out-of-the-world girl? Huh? <laughs> both worlds, he's saying <laughs> We would like to see the girl if she's here. Well, uh, see, in terms of uh, doing anything in the world, well, we should know what we are doing, the capability, intelligence, all these things are there. But one important aspect that especially when you're young, you try to miss is the timing. If you don't time your actions right, even the best actions will go waste. Timing it. Is there… Uh, so people who don't know how to time it, they will look, look at the astrological chart and say, this is good time, bad time, auspicious time, inauspicious time. Uh, because it's nine o'clock, your girl was coming, it's Rahu Kala, you don't look at her. <laughs> hey, it's bombed, <laughs> your love affair is over <laughs> So those who don't know how to time their life, they will start looking for standard charts, what is good time, what is bad time. There's no such thing. Timing is most important.
this is something I'm constantly striving with people around me to understand the significance of timing. They all think the significance of the action they understand, but they don't understand most of the time the significance of timing. If the timing is right, even a small action will produce a huge impact. The timing is wrong, even if you push so hard, only little will happen. So timing is very, very important. How do you arrive at this? This is a complex affair because you, first of all, let's only handle one aspect because if you go into the other, you will fall into the astrological charts. One aspect is, see you as a human being, let's say you take twenty-four hour time or if you want to take a longer time, let's say a week or a month if we take, in one month, twenty-four hours every day, one month long, thirty days. Are you in the same state of physical and mental competence? No, it's all the time going here and there. So when you want to hit an important shot, you must be at your best. So this timing you take care of it. Outside timing is there, that'll take a lot of experience and wisdom to time with the world. But at least with you, you time it. When you are at your best, you do important things. When you're not so good, you don't do it. Just uh, three days ago, somebody in Bangalore was telling someone else here about his experience of driving with me. Many years ago, almost eight years ago, he still remembers because it so terrified him. Because my right leg is heavy <laughs> So he said, the way he was driving that day, I said, Sadhguru, don't drive like this. He said, uh, it seems I said, I don't remember, maybe I said. I, it's, uh, because I look at it like that, I should have said. <laughs> on a particular day when I'm on, I know today I can do anything and I will do it right, anything. Another day, I'm little not there. Then I know today I'm… I step back and I go a little more cautiously like everybody else, otherwise I go boom. So I'm driving that day like that <laughs> and he's terrified. I said, don't worry, today nothing will happen because I'm in this condition. This day nothing will go wrong for me, I'm on today. So this timing at least, there is also timing with the rest of the world, the situations. That will take much more experience and observation to hit the right thing at the right time. But at least the timing with yourself that you are at your best. When you want to do important things, you are at your best. This must happen. Once you understand this, then you will realize it's extremely important to keep yourself at your best every moment of your life. Because every little thing that you do, if you learn to do it with as much significance as the so-called big things that you do, then you will see the cumulative impact of that over a period of time is so big. You didn't do anything big, you did only little, little things. But these little things add up to something phenomenal simply because you took care to do those little things with absolute intention and attention, intensity of uh, expression of what you're doing. So one fundamental thing before you realize and read all these things properly within yourself and around yourself, one simple thing is just this, you don't decide what is important, what is not important. Just pay as much attention to everything the same way and apply yourself with the same level of intensity. If God comes, same intensity. If an ant comes, same intensity of attention and involvement. You just do this, everything will sort itself out. The right now, the biggest problem with human beings is they think this is important, that's not important, this person is great, this person is no good, this is okay, this is not okay, this is God, this is devil. This is their problem. In this, they're becoming half a life because half the time they're not there because they think it's not important. Tell me you're breathing right now, is it important? Yes. So you must do it with total involvement and intensity. Then we'll say, we'll call you a yogi. You understand? You… you… at least the beard is coming. You better learn to breathe properly <laughs> No, no, the beard doesn't just grow on a yogi, it grows on every man <laughs> Why they have removed it, you must ask <laughs> Nobody knows. So, if it is not important, you must stop it, isn't it? Just do this one thing, 
there is no such thing as important and not important. Whether you look at your friend or you look at somebody you don't like, you, you look some doing something important or important in socially or not so important socially, as far as you are concerned as a life, every moment of your life is equally important. Everything that you do is important. What is not important, just don't do it. Why are you investing in your life? Why are you investing your life in something that you think is not important? You're doing something silly, let's say. I think it's not important, it doesn't matter. But you think it's important. Only if you think it's important, you must invest your life in it, isn't it? Otherwise, why? If you do this, you will arrive at the timing, it will take a little time, but you will arrive at the timing and that timing is extremely important, extremely. You have… Uh, you watched uh, games, let's say maybe cricket or golf if you watched, always everybody is talking about the timing of hitting the ball. Strength of hitting the ball is not the thing, it's the timing. Somebody hits the same ball with great amount of, you know, wasting energy, Another person just flicks it, it goes to the same place. It's a timing. That is true even in your life. Timing is the most important thing because the time that you have in this life and the energy that you have in your life is limited. It's a limited resource. Nobody has endless energy, isn't it? Nobody has endless time. So, you have to time it right. First thing is to ta start observing yourself when you're at your best. You must do. And now, if you observe yourself sufficiently, you will see you have to be at your best every moment. There's no such thing as this is important, this is not important. So Sadhguru, there are times in life when I'm just doing excellent, doing to my fullest. But then, suddenly a feeling creeps in, which tells me that your downfall is near. It bothers me. And Maybe you're just landing. Yes. And with this feeling, getting into the system, uh, my performance actually starts to deteriorate. So Sadhguru, how do we fight these inner monstrous voices? How many monsters do you have? <laughs> within you. I thought there's only one monster, that's you. <laughs> this we must be very clear. See, if you are hearing two voices within you, an angelic voice and a monstrous voice, this doesn't mean something fantastic has happened. This means you're either schizophrenic or you're possessed. <laughs> yes. You either need a psychiatrist or an exorcist <laughs> So, this is very important. This people are doing in the name of religion, in the name of spirituality, in the name of uh, so-called modern solutions to everything. In many ways, this is finding expression. In India, we have a huge vocabulary for these things. If you say anything to anybody, oh, this is my ankara, this is my ego doing this, this is my… this is my soul, this is my this, this is my that. Well, if so many people are speaking from within you, if so many people are stuck in this one body, this is a ailment, isn't it? Hello? If there is more than one in this body, is this an ailment or no? Only one. This body is designed for one, isn't it? This is the most fundamental thing you must do. There's just you and you and you in this. There is no another. The moment there is another, this is a trick. Initially you play this trick. When something happens well, of course it's me. When something didn't happen, I don't know, some other voice, somebody else, my ego, <laughs> my… All kinds of other creatures which don't exist, you manufacture in your mind. You can call it Atman, Paramatman, God speaks within you, devil speaks within you. See, whenever people said, God spoke to me, disasters unfolded. <laughs> yes, have you seen this? The President of the United States at one time, 
about fifteen years ago or eighteen years ago, said, God told me, oh, what a disaster, six hundred thousand people died and a whole nation destroyed. That is the kind of things always happen when God spoke because… because I want you to understand, it's not about God speaking. When you want to say something absolutely illogical and unreasonable, you bring the God and the devil. So, if there is more than one voice, you have to kill the other voices. For this you must understand, there is a complexity to human mind. That's what is fantastic about us. If you had the brain of an earthworm, of course you would be eco-friendly <laughs> but there would be no IIT, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I have nothing against the earthworms, they are fantastic creatures <laughs> but there would be no IIT for sure. There would be no technology, they would be just eco-friendly, earth would be good with earthworms. But so many things, possibilities wouldn't happen. So the complexity of who we are is the greatest gift we have, isn't it so? There is a cerebral complexity which is what makes us who we are. This is the greatest gift, but this is what every human being is suffering. I'm asking all of you, though you are in Karakpur, when was the last time you were stabbed by a dagger? Hello? Even in Bengal it didn't happen <laughs> oh, They're really ignoring you, okay? <laughs> Maybe the biggest thing that happened to you is a mosquito bit you. That is the level of suffering that the world is inflicting upon you. Rest of the suffering is all on self-help, isn't it? So why are you suffering like this? Because I'll ask you a simple question, tell me yes or no. Because I'm also going to bless you according to your question. Do you want your intellect to be sharp or blunt? Okay. <laughs> what department are these guys? Is it political science? <laughs> Is it one of the disciplines, sir? Is it one of the disciplines in the… No. Oh. Then how? <laughs> There's infiltration in your college <laughs> So, uh, you naturally want your intellect to be sharp, that means Intellect is a cutting instrument, it's like a knife, the sharper it is, the better it is, isn't it? So there are children who are being tortured here <laughs> by me, by me. The pa parents have come out of their eagerness but I'm not singing a lullaby or anything, I'm talking like this <laughs> So suppose uh, there is a very sharp knife here, would you give it to the child? Why? Because, not because a knife is dangerous, because the child may not be steady enough to handle such a sharp instrument, it could hurt itself or it could hurt somebody. So right now, of after millions of years of evolution, we gave you an intellect. We means I am on the side of nature, okay? We gave you a sharp mind. Now you're cutting yourself all over the place and you're complaining about it. <laughs> no, no, when something is sharp given to you, you must learn how to hold it, isn't it? You have to learn how to handle it. If you hold it at the wrong end or if you move irresponsibly, you will cut yourself. Right now, these are all individual expressions of uh, someday I feel like this, someday I feel like this. Human beings essentially are going through a whole lot of suffering. 
somebody is in the war zone, somebody is in a famine zone, I will leave those human beings because that's a different scene. But the rest of the people are all suffering only one thing, their own intelligence. If you took half their brain away, they would sit peacefully. <laughs> yes or no? No demons, no gods, no voices, peaceful. Yes or no? So we are complaining about the greatest gift that we have. The only reason why compared to all other creatures we are dominating here is because of our cerebral capability, isn't it? You're not as strong as an elephant, you're not as ferocious as a tiger, but the poor tiger needs to be protected today. <laughs> it's no more a tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night <laughs> Poor tiger, we need to save it because… Uh, because of the sharpness of our mind, we are able to just about do anything. And this has become the problem. So this has become the problem because we gave you a very complex machine and you not bother to read the user's manual <laughs> and you're trying to handle it blindly, now all kinds of things will speak. I want you to understand this, the… in… Uh, in the cases of schizophrenia, the largest number of personalities that have happened or manifested in one human being that they have studied, there could be more somewhere else, but what has been studied and recorded is Thirty-two full-scale personalities in one human being has been studied and recorded, thirty-two. That is like thirty-two people are living in this body and talking different languages and incredible capabilities. This guy speaks Bengali, that guy speaks Kannada, that guy speaks Malayalam or like this. They just pick this up because everything that you heard somewhere is recorded. If you want each one of them, you can make it into a different personality. Right now maybe there is no conscious memory of here in this… Uh, I'm sure in this uh, campus, so many people are speaking so many different languages. If there are three Tamil people and they're speaking Tamil, you didn't understand a word of it, but it is recorded. If you want, you can make that into a person of your own and tomorrow start speaking Tamil. And that person knows Tamil. You as a person do not know, that's how complex mind is. It has a million chambers. You will never get to explore all of it. But the important thing is, you must establish within yourself, there's only one you. Only then you can use this, otherwise it'll use you because it's too complex. Everybody is afraid today, wherever I go, <laughs> they're calling me for all kinds of artificial intelligence uh, conferences in the world and their fear is, it'll take away our jobs, it'll dominate our life, it'll take over the world. I said, yes, if you remain as stupid as you are, it will. For sure it will Because right now, your own intellect has taken over your life and destroying you, make you suffer for nothing. If I leave you alone in a room, all by yourself, if you are capable of being miserable, this means you're in bad company, isn't it? Hello? <laughs> if I am with you and you suffered, maybe it's me. But you are sitting alone and suffering, this means you are in bad company, isn't it? You have to fix that one thing, that this one is never bad company. This is the best company you have. <laughs> For this, there is a simple… Uh, Treatment, this simple treatment is just this. You start seeing this much, whatever happens to me in my life, good things happen, ugly things happen, nonsense happens, great things happens, doesn't matter whatever happens and whatever did not happen in my life, it's all my responsibility. Now, there'll be only one person. If you see, this is my responsibility, there'll be only one person. Otherwise, God will speak here, devil will speak there, Atma will speak from here, Paramatman will speak from somewhere else <laughs> and they'll drive you crazy. See, 
most of the society is in different levels of madness. If you're alone and if you can suffer, you're in some state of madness, isn't it so? Only thing is you're in a socially accepted level of madness. You have to graduate to go into a asylum. <laughs> but without anybody doing anything, if I am able to cause enormous misery to myself, is this a case or no? Hello? Is it a case, isn't it? But because everybody is in the same state, we think it's normal. No, it's not normal. Somebody coming and doing something good to you or bad to you is a possibility. You should never cause damage to this, isn't it? Hello? If you are causing trouble to this, obviously you haven't figured out the fundamentals of your own existence. This is why it is very, very important that I'm not starting a political party <laughs> So, Sadhguru, uh, I learned from uh, my mentor architect that architectural interventions should not be just about minimizing ecological disturbance, but it must be instead about enhancing the very life that resides in a structure. Uh, so, as an architecture student, I would like to know if design has the ability to heal and improve the quality of the life of the people occupying a structure. See, uh, if you look at the physical world, whether it's your body or a blade of grass or the planet or whatever, the physical universe is all about geometry, isn't it? Just to give you an example, this is about a three years ago maybe, and uh, I'm walking through the yoga center, which is people generally think it's very well its architecture is unique and different. So I'm walking through for various details looking at it. Then I see in a place where lots of people come every day, there is a tree branch which was in a certain… this thing. So I looked at this and I said, please cut this tree branch. I did not explain to them, I just said cut it and I went on. Then the next day I was leaving the country and I was not there for about a month and a half. Then after uh, two or three weeks, they wrote a very apologetic note to me, saying that, Sadhguru, you asked us to cut the tree branch, but we thought, why would Sadhguru want to cut a tree branch? When always I'm talking about, you are not going to cut anything which is not absolutely necessary. Uh, we didn't cut it, but the rain and winds came and it fell down. Fortunately, there were no people. If there were people, things would have happened, you know. We're very sorry, we don't know why you asked us to cut. See, how long something stands or how well something functions physically is only a question of geometry. I'm saying even your body, how you sit will determine how long the different parts of your body will last, how you stand, how you walk. Today, uh, for runners and others, do you know this posture correction has become a huge science? They got machines, they got all scanning machines which will tell you if you stand like this, how your vertebra are, how your ribs are, how you… if you do like this, where is your stomach, where is your liver, all this because if you run the wrong way, you will damage yourself. This is coming to sports in a big way now, but yoga is always about this. The whole system of yoga, is about aligning your geometry with a larger cosmic geometry so that you can function with least amount of friction. If we say there are mechanical engineers, aren't they? If you say a machine is well engineered, essentially you are saying its geometry is well aligned. A misaligned geometry means lots of friction, isn't it? So this goes for your body, this for ev this goes for every shape and form, everything that is functional in the universe has to be geometrically in sync, otherwise it will cause disturbance. So does the geometry of a building make a difference? Absolutely. 
especially if you're a little sensitive, it will make a huge difference. For everybody it makes a difference, most people don't understand, no, don't notice anything about themselves. They only understand the consequence. They only understand I'm not feeling good. They don't know why they're not feeling good. People don't notice that. But the very shapes and forms that you have around you has a certain impact because you are also a physical form. And how this physical form is, how this is, how that is, all this has a certain geometric impact. If you… I'm sure many of you have felt this, especially the girls probably would feel it more. If they walk into a building, oh, I don't like this, just like that. You know, it's always when men and women, husband and wife go to buy a house, the husband sees all the brochures and says, this is good, this is good and it's priced well, it's fantastic. She walks in and says, I don't like it <laughs> Why? I don't like it, that's all <laughs> Because she doesn't feel good, that's all she knows. She doesn't know why she doesn't feel good. She doesn't know wha what is the shape which is causing this, but she knows this doesn't feel good. So, the shapes and forms have a significant impact on you if we paid enough attention. Sid, you must look at this. You're from South. Well, you come from Kerala. You must look at the South Indian temples, how geometrically perfect they are. You take your laser measuring instruments today and check it, it's perfect, you know. How important that the right angles are right, in this building it's not right <laughs> And how the shapes and forms make a difference is something that they examined to the minutest possible thing when they built the ancient temples, particularly in the south. The North Indian temples are all brick temples, they're done in a certain way, it looks like they've all been put up in a hurry, you know. Now why I'm saying this is, uh, I think uh, the northern belt took a lot of invasions and ancient temples were destroyed, they all put it up in a hurry. When they could, they just put it up. But in South, they took time and engineered it in a certain way. You can feel it. You don't have to believe anything. You just go and sit there. You feel a certain… that space has a certain impact on you. Our home should be built like this. Our offices should be built like this. Because it's very important that… See, we know this for plants and animals and everything. The atmosphere in which they live is very important, the habitat, otherwise they won't thrive, isn't it? The same goes for the human being. If you just want to somehow live and die, you can live anywhere. But if you want to thrive, really, then it's important how… what kind of spaces you live in. There is a whole science to this, which is generally called as Agama. People think it's temple building uh, science, it's not about temple building. It was to be built… every human habitation was to be built that way. Whole lot of people couldn't afford it for their house, they did it only for the temple because it takes more uh, involvement and uh, care for this. So this is the reason, this is one of the reasons why you Kerala people, no matter what, first thing in the morning, you shower, you go… See, you must understand only in the south this instruction is still there, in the north it's gone. In south, even today this instruction is there. If you go to the temple, you don't have to pray, you don't have to appeal to some god, you just have to sit there for some time, huh? Have they told you? You must sit there. But what people are doing today is they're just touching their bottom to the floor and going away. That's not the idea. The space has been built with such care. You must sit there and experience this and allow your system to make use of it because this is a geometry too. The entire system of yoga is just this. The Hatha yoga is all about correcting your geometry constantly that if you walk through the world, you will walk through it effortlessly. If your geometry is not right, then you will see every point will get tangled up. So, architecture in India is right now, except a few, the new architecture that's been done, unfortunately we have a serious, uh, you know, mental enslavement. Whatever is done in the Western countries, we're doing it not considering our weather, our the temperatures and everything simply, even uh, our clothing is like that, largely. If you go out of IIT, probably most of you will be wearing a, a suit, a jacket and… and a noose around your neck. 
in forty degrees temperature. Yeah. How to wear a jacket? I was uh, meeting some important CEOs and I told them, see in your board meetings, it's compulsory in lot of companies, they must be jacketed and tied up. I said, a CEO means people expect he will do the most sensible things. I mean, now we must… we must understand, a large company means people have handed over their own money, their savings, their hard-earned savings to somebody and expect this guy to do the most sensible thing. But this guy wears thick jacket and a tie in forty degrees temperature. I don't expect this guy to do sensible things <laughs> So, architecture is not just about the buildings, the very ways we sit and stand, the furniture, even our clothing is architecture in a way. All right, we may call it by different names, we may call it design, fashion, but it's essentially about shapes and forms. It's very, very important. It's time we bring it because last fifty years or so, since nineteen fifty, since this IIT, we've been in a survival mode, desperately trying to somehow make our people survive in this country. Now we have come to a reasonable levels of well-being, Though it's not touch every human being, at least large segments have come to reasonable things. This is the time that we need to look at more sophisticated way of existence. And it's not always expensive, it is not. We can create something very wonderful. You must come and see, we've created buildings. See that right now I'm telling you the simplest thing. Right now this is a flat roof, I don't know what… what is this roof outside? A-frame, is it? It's a A-frame. So right now, between the roof and the gravity, there is a fight. Going on or not? You may not see the fight, but it's happening. There is tension here. And one day, some day, who do you think will win? The structure or the gravity? Gravity will win. So we created structures which are standing up, not because of the strength of the material, but simply because of the perfection of geometry. So it's the gravity which is holding it up, not gravity pulling it down. You must come and see these buildings, they're unique and fantastic. The one thing I'm very proud of that we created, the building is designed to last for at least a minimum of three to five thousand years, because there is no material, they're deteriorating. There's no steel, there is no cement, there's no concrete, it's just burnt brick, See, even if you go to Mahanjadaro or Harappa or whatever the most ancient civilization, what is it that you find? Burnt clay is the only thing that survived. It's burnt brick and just lime which is holding the thing up. It's not the strength of the material, it's the perfection of geometry. Unless a very… it's seismologically sensitive area, so we put it on sand beds. So it takes small shock. Suppose a very major earthquake which opened up the land happened, only then it'll come down, otherwise it'll not come down. Sadhguru, uh, I have a follow-up on this. But I think today, in today's uh, scenario, we have a standard set of codes which are developed by uh, <laughs> the most <laughs> premier institutes. And uh, it seems like nobody just wants to take the responsibility of the work that they are doing themselves, they just want to put it on the code. So if the building comes down, they just say that, you know, I followed the code and it was not my fault and they just don't take the responsibility of it. See, for… Uh, they're trying to do everything by the thumb rule, all right? If you want to do things by thumb rule, you don't need an engineer or an architect, you need a mystery. <laughs> you… You call yourself an architect because you think beyond the standards and what they say, this big member is needed, you engine… you… you get the geometry of it right and put this big member and still make it safe, that is where an architect is, otherwise a mestri will do it. So Sadhguru, in… in the campus we can find a large number of couples uh, who spend almost all their time together. <laughs> Uh, 
now the matter is uh, when they separate at least one of the two people has to go through a time when they are completely alone and at that time because they don't have the person they had for the entire day negative thoughts start to come inside their head so the question a lot of us have to ask is how can we be both happy and alone because in my understanding these are not two words that go along with each other oh it's a popular question <laughs> then you must find somebody out of the world That means she is not in this world, you're safe. <laughs> See, uh, well, we must understand this. In the nature of human development, there is a body. All of us have a body. We have a mind, we have emotions, we have energies. If you put your body as the leading edge of your life, if your body leads you, then the only thing you can think of is eating, sleeping, reproduction. You may avoid the reproduction but copulation, yes. No, I'm not saying this in any negative way. I'm saying if body is the leading edge, by the time you're fourteen, you want to do something, yes. Hello? But suppose your mind developed in a certain way, suddenly what everybody is excited about looking at a boy or a girl, your mind is excited about something else because your intellect has become the leading edge. Or if your emotions, don't understand emotions as only for each other, emotion is beyond each other. You're capable of emotions all by yourself, that's what you're saying in a way when you're alone. There are emotions. So emotion is not about somebody. Well, somebody else may stimulate a certain emotion, but you can sit here and create whatever emotion you want right now, isn't it? All by yourself. So emotion is not about somebody. Maybe you know emotion only as a reaction to something right now, but emotion, intelligence, body and energies are not about somebody. It is about this life. This is all the equipment we got. We have a body, we have a mind, we have emotions and we have energy to support that. Now, you must decide in your life which should be the leading edge. This is not about getting rid of the body. Body is there, it's very important. Without this platform, we cannot exist. But do you want this platform to be the leading edge? Right now, we are sitting on a platform. Should this one speak or I should speak? You must decide. You must decide, this should speak or I should speak. We are sitting on the platform and speaking, isn't it? Similarly, we are sitting on this platform right now as a life. Physical body is most important. If you don't keep it well, it will become the most important thing in your life. If ill health comes, you will see body is the most important thing. All the time, twenty-four hours, you'll only think of that. So, what should be leading edge in your life, you must decide. Once you made the decision, whether it's your intelligence or your body or your emotion or your life energies, if you have to look at it this way, your body can only speak this. It will talk about what to eat, how… sleeping, reproduction, this is all it can think about. It cannot… it is not equipped to think about anything else. Your intellect can do so many things, but that also functions only from the limited data that you have gathered in your head. Right now, if you're thinking architecture, that's because information has gone in. Right now, you're thinking of that boy or that girl because that information has been recorded. Or you're thinking about money or position or fame or name because that data has gone into your system, isn't it? So, your intellect is only functioning from the limited data that you have gathered so it should not be the leading edge because then you will do only those limited things in your life. If you go by the body, you will do very limited things. If you go by the intellect, you will do next level of limited things. If you go by your emotion, 
then you may do something beautiful, but at the same time you may get tangled up in all kinds of things because emotion is not independent of the intellect. The way you think is the way you feel, isn't it? If I think you're just wonderful, then I have sweet emotions towards you. If I think this guy is horrible, I have nasty emotions towards you, isn't it? So the way you think is the way you feel, it's just that emotions are little more sappier than the thought. Thought is agile, thought is dry, emotion is little juicy. They're not different. But your life energies, every moment of your life, no matter what the hell you did, what the hell you did not do, your life energies have been constantly working for your well-being, never worked against you till now, isn't it? So you must decide which should be the leading edge. All others will follow, all the four ingredients all of us have. But what should lead your life? This you must decide. If you want to be led towards a significant life, then your life energy should be the leading edge, others should follow. If body is the leading edge, then the first opportunity you get, you will get entangled with something. And of course your emotion and your thought will come and play havoc with all that. Is it right or wrong? I'm… I'm not somebody who looks at these things in a moralistic way, but this is a time of your life when you must build yourself up. You are in a little bit of a hurry to live. When you are in a hurry to live, you will lack wisdom. And uh, this will play out in so many different ways. It's like this, the mango farmers in India have a certain wisdom. Bengal also produces mangoes, right? If you plant a mango tree, I've been a mango farmer myself. If you plant a mango tree, within the first twelve months or fourteen months, flowers will come. So we go about meticulously removing every flower on the tree, not allowing it to fruit. If you leave it, fruits will come. So up to three years or four years, a wise farmer, up to four years he will make sure not a single fruit comes. You have to remove every single flower, otherwise suddenly one fruit will come. If one tree among… let's say you have a hundred, one tree came up with a fruit within three years or four years' time, you will see that is one tree which will not yield in the future because it lived too early. Uh, so Sadhguru, I have one last question from our side. Sometime back, I happened to be in a situation where a friend of mine was drunk. So, when she was in the drunk state, she was repeatedly saying that, please don't judge me as I'm drinking, please don't judge me <laughs> It is… Uh, but she has lost her judgment, but you… she doesn't want you <laughs> So my question is, whether it is alcohol or not, in life, why are we so apprehensive about being judged by others and how can we not let this come on our way of being happy? Look at me. See, I'm always stoned. <laughs> Never touched the substance, but always stoned. You can judge me whichever way you want <laughs> Because one thing is, I am stoned in such a way that I have not lost my judgment at all. And at the same time, whichever way you judge me has absolutely no impact on me because I am completely stoned. Having said that, why this consumption of alcohol 
and drugs is growing the way it's growing in the world is. Well, uh, nobody can really put a number on this, but just for… just to say to what extent. In the last twenty-five years in India, probably alcohol consumption has gone up ten thousand percent. What do you think? Hmm? You know, I'm telling you when we were growing up, in the town there would be just ten, fifteen people who drink in a small town, I'm saying. People say, in that family they drink, we won't give our girls to that family, you know? But today, if you don't serve drink at your wedding, nobody will come <laughs> So why this need for alcohol and drug has gone up so much? This is because the heavens have been collapsing. Yes, <laughs> I was in Bangalore just uh, three, four weeks ago. There were over eight thousand people doing a two-day program with me. And just casually I asked, how many of you think you will go to heaven? Only five hands went up <laughs> Then I asked, are you all the hell people? <laughs> no, it's just that both heaven and hell have collapsed in people's minds. This happened, okay? They'll joke to you. One day, a nice Catholic girl, Mary, came home and she was distressed. Her mother asked, Mary, my baby, what happened? Why are you like this? She said, Antony proposed to me. So mother said, isn't that wonderful? You've been with him for so long, is it good he proposed to you? Why are you unhappy about that? Mama, he sins with me without any regret. And he doesn't even believe in hell. How do I marry him? The mother said, don't you worry, my child, both of us together will prove him wrong <laughs> So, <laughs> heavens have collapsed. When I say heavens have collapsed, it's like this. Maybe you heard this somewhere. You know, there was a Sunday school going on in Alabama. Alabama is a very special state in the United States. So the local priest was going full fire. But unfortunately, the audience were not like you, they were all tiny tots. Catch them young policy. Full force he was going. He was enjoying his own rhetoric so much, he stopped midway and asked, what do you have to do to go to heaven? Of course, little Mary in the front row stood up and said, if I scrub the church floor every Sunday morning, I will go to heaven. Absolutely! <laughs> Another little girl stood up and said, if I share my pocket money with my less privileged friend, I will go to heaven. Correct! Another boy stood up there and said, if I help people who are in need, I will go to heaven. Correct! Little Tommy in the back bench stood up and said, you got to die first. That's a qualification. If you want to go to heaven, you got to die first <laughs> So when you die, whether you like it or you don't like it, unless you're Elon Musk, <laughs> we usually bury your body here or burn it or cut it and throw it to the birds. Something we will do depending on what tradition you belong to. But we will put this body back to earth 
because after all we picked it up from this planet. At least that much responsibility you must have. You should not take this body and go away. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately nobody can take it and go. If you have not done anything ecologic… eco-friendly in your life, this is one thing you will do. You will put this body back onto this earth, it's a very good thing. So you went to heaven and you… what is in heaven? This you must know. In the Hindu heaven, food is very good <laughs> Yes, Nala himself cooks for you. If you are a foodie, you must go to Hindu heaven. In another place, there are those white-gowned ladies floating in the clouds <laughs> They usually don't have legs, they're just floating. Because to float you don't need legs, common sense. If you like that kind of ambience, that's where you go. If you go to another place, you will encounter virgin problems. If that's what you want, that's where you go. But the only problem is you don't have a body. When you don't have a body, what do you do with good food and virgins, I want to know <laughs> So, see, this is… this is the first time in the history of humanity that this many people in the world can think for themselves. Otherwise, your priest, your mullah, your pandit or a book was thinking for you. The first time that so many people can think for themselves, or they're thinking right, thinking wrong, there are many issues about that. But they're thinking right, thinking wrong, but they're thinking. First of all, women, till about fifty or hundred years ago, a woman was not even supposed to think, she's not supposed to think. This straight away fifty percent of the population has burst into the thinking process. It's a huge number. For the first time, this is only second, third generation which is beginning to think for themselves. Otherwise, they were not even supposed to think. So when so many people are thinking, see when you talk to somebody, you think somebody else is illogical, but in their mind, there is some kind of crazy logic functioning, isn't it? When you get into argument with people, you see this. You think you're logically correct, but the other person also thinks he is logically correct. He has his own crazy sense of logic, but they have their own framework of logic. So all illogical things are naturally collapsing. Still, this generation has not fully walked away from it, still there is fear, they can't openly say there is no goddamn hell or heaven. They're still fearful about it, but they're trying to make a little heaven for themselves here. So, hey, wait, wait, wait <laughs> So naturally, when they're not able to do it for themselves, out of their own intelligence, they will fall back on chemicals. Today, just to take very affluent societies, because every society is aspiring to be like that, let's say you take United States, which is the most affluent nation on the planet right now. I don't know if half the IIT after graduation will be in United States, because wherever I go in US, whoever I meet, they say, I am IIT this, I am IIT that. So, uh, seventy percent of U.S. population is on prescription medication. Another thirty percent, of course, buying it off the back streets <laughs> Seventy percent on prescription medication means, though… see, what is affluence, let's understand this. Why an individual person or a society or a nation seeks affluence is, at first level, it'll give us a choice of food. 
If I'm affluent, I can eat what I want. Eating means nourishment. I can nourish myself well. When a man is poor, the biggest problem is I'm not well nourished. So at first level, it is a choice of nourishment. At a second level, it's a choice of lifestyles. So you are the most affluent nation, you have an enormous choice of nourishment and an enormous choice of lifestyles. But seventy percent is on medical prescription medication. Three trillion dollars of healthcare bill, it can sink a nation, all right? It's bigger than our budget. Our… our GDP is only 2.7 trillion. Three trillion dollars worth of healthcare in America for quarter the number of people that we are. Most affluent nation, obviously affluence is not working. To be healthful, you need chemicals. To be joyful, you need chemicals. To be peaceful, you need chemicals. To be ecstatic, of course, <laughs> that is ecstasy. So, I'm not even looking at it morally. It's… it's ne never a moral issue for me. All I'm seeing is, if we become chemically dependent, because there's also another scale, the food that we eat is full of chemicals, the water that we drink is full of poison. Some genius came up with this idea that you can poison the water, kill all the bacteria and it won't poison me. <laughs> I don't know where this idea came from. <laughs> Some genius idea this is. Because on this planet, all life, whether a single-celled animal or the most complex creature, which is we, we are made the same way, essentially the fundamental design is same. What kills a bacteria also kills us, maybe it takes a bigger dose, that's all. Water is poisoned, air is poisoned. Air, I believe, will get purified in the next ten to fifteen years' time, because a whole lot of movement is happening in that direction. Air we can handle very easily. The biggest problem is soil and water. So that is another level of chemicals. If ninety percent of this population right now is chem… on chemicals, believe me, the next generation that we produce will be a generation which is much less than us. If we produce a next generation less than ourselves, we have committed a crime against humanity because the next generation must be at least one step ahead of us. Otherwise, we've lost it. We've lost the entire process of civilization when we produce a next generation which is actually less than us. So, we are heading towards this rapidly unless we teach individual human beings how to simply sit here and be blissed out. Stoned enough or no? Just look at this. <laughs> but am I… am I conscious enough, alert enough, clear enough? If there was a way to intoxicate yourself without losing your judgment, without losing your awareness, without losing your intelligence, it's a great thing. Intoxication is a fantastic thing. Only problem is it takes away your judgment, it takes away your intelligence, incapacitates you. That is the problem, isn't it? Because life is about enhancement, life is not about crippling yourself. Now in the name of intoxication, you're crippling yourself. All right? This happened. Shankaran Pillai was walking in London. No, London? He just came out of an Irish bar and he put one leg in the gutter and kept on dragging and walking late in the night. The London Bobby, the policeman, came, looked at this and said, Hey, you look totally drunk. But Shankaran Pillai said, are you sure? He said, absolutely, you're drunk. Look at the way you're walking, half in the gutter, half on the street. Shankaran Pillai said, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I thought I was crippled. <laughs> when people are drunk, they're crippled, isn't it? If you could be drunk without being crippled, you could be enhanced, it would be great. Is it true? Ask anybody, you're not in the medical sciences, but ask anybody, is it true that this body here is the greatest chemical factory in the universe right now? The universe that we know at least, hmm? Only problem is you're a lousy manager. 
If you know how to manage this, you would be like me, always blissed out. Anybody can say what they want, anybody can do what they want, this is like this only. Because I have not given this privilege to anybody, that somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy, somebody can make me miserable. Right now, you are a consequence of other people's opinions. Where do you plan to go like this? Anybody can ruin you. You went outside, somebody told you, Shreya, you are the most wonderful human being we have seen. Then you were flo floating on that cloud, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. What number? What number? Nine. Oh, in south we do eleven <laughs> You were floating on cloud whatever number and you came home, people at home told you who you really are <laughs> and the cloud will crash. No, no. It's very important that neither this way or that way, we listen to everybody because we could be doing something wrong. Hello? Any moment we could be doing something wrong, so we listen to everybody. But what they say will not determine how I am, never, ever. This you must fix and you must tell your friend when she's not drunk <laughs> because otherwise she won't understand. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru, for answering our questions. We want to ask you a lot more things, but due to time constraints, we'll move to the next section of uh, social media questions, where uh, a lot of people have asked various questions on the social media platform, and we would request you to answer a few of them. So the first the first question is from Georgie. Sadhguru, we, we know that you are always a game for adventure, but many young people mindlessly get into adventure sports and even lose their lives in the process. Uh, what is your suggestion for the youth who get into adventure sports? Well, I have no right to advise anybody on this arena. Because I did everything that could have killed me two dozen times <laughs> but uh, I'm here <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so, uh, see when we say adventure, you can have ventures in your life or you can have adventure. Adventure means you don't know where your next foot is going to be, that's adventure, that means there is danger. No danger, everything safe, there is no adventure, isn't it? It's a venture. I'm not against ventures, but you're talking about adventure. That means you want to step into something that you don't know, isn't it? If you step into what you know, unpredictable, that's not an adventure, that's just an activity. So, I must tell you this, Why should I tell you all this and make some crazy people do something crazy? <laughs> well, uh, one thing, my father, the physician and constantly worried about me, his greatest worry was, he would knock his head and say, this boy has no fear in his heart, what will happen to him? I've heard this dialogue right from the age of five, six. He has no fear, what will happen, what will happen? One day I was around eleven, he said the same thing. He has no fear in his… because about twelve foot long cobra came, I just picked it up and walked away. So he… he kind of… he… this is the first time he's seeing, I've been doing since I was six <laughs> The first time he saw. And then he had a Vespa scooter. From the age of nine, I've been riding it without him knowing I was cleaning it for him, but I was riding it <laughs> So one day, it's a, you know, in front of our house, the road is slopey like this. I'm just coming in, putting it in the neutral gear and I'm standing on the seat and coming like this on the Vespa scooter, he saw me and his heart broke <laughs> So he said, this boy has no fear in his heart what to do. 
Then I asked him, when did fear become a virtue? He said, see I told you he has no fear <laughs> So why are we thinking that we have to enter life fearfully? If you're fearful, fear is one of the worst emotions that people go through in their lives. Why fear happens is, you are imagining something that's yet to happen. Hello? You are imagining something. So what you are suffering is not some situation, you are suffering your own imagination. No, imagination is a fantastic thing, you are an architect. You must imagine, but if every building that you imagine, if you fear it may fall down, <laughs> it'll drive you crazy <laughs> Even in architecture, there is adventure, isn't it? You must see Ranakpur. Have you seen Ranakpur in Rajasthan? You must see. Ranakpur also has Kumbhalgar within twenty kilometers. It's the la second largest wall on the planet. Most Indians know because we keep all the things that we should be proud of a secret. The second largest wall on the planet, which if you look at it aerially, you would mistake this to be Great Wall of China. It's that big. But most Indians don't even know there is a wall like this, it's in Kumbhalgar. Close to that is Ranakpur. This architect is a madman. But he's a very super sane madman because he knows what he's doing. See, if you build a building, this is a temple with one thousand columns. If you're thinking about safety, what would you do? Just in case over a period of time if one column collapses, because those days the material is only stone, there is no steel and concrete and stuff. You would make sure if one column fa falls down, there will be a, another column which will keep the temple up. No, he built it in such way, the docity of him is such. If you pull down one column, the entire temple will come down. His pride in his intelligence and capability is such that he made it in such a way, if one column comes, the temple should not exist. And it's standing for over five hundred, six hundred years without any issue. You will see something like that in the yoga center. We built an elliptical dome, no steel, no concrete. And at the top, it's only eight inches thick and just to freak people, I left a, a nine feet uh, diameter hole. People said, this is going to collapse. It will not collapse. If you don't have any adventure in your life, in whatever you do, it doesn't matter, in every sphere of life, there is room for adventure. This means you must trust your capability and competence and a step one step more than that. There is a risk, of course. If there is no risk, there is no adventure, isn't it? So, will young people get killed? Yes, unfortunately, sometimes it does. Before I became thirty-five years of age, at least twelve, thirteen of my friends died. Some in motorcycle, some in hang gliding and uh, all the things we were doing together, some of them died. Well, they didn't kill me, but Could I live without having done all those things? No. Even if one of those situations had ended me, still I would do it. Not simply out of egoistic jingoism that you want to do something others cannot do, it's not about that. It's about stretching yourself beyond your limits somewhere. But today, the world is far more organized, there's a whole lot of equipment. When we were doing it, crazy things, we had no equipment of any kind. We just did things just like that. But today there is safety equipment, there are systems, there are nets and there are so many things. Well, one of you should start a venture in adventure and bring the right equipment and everything. See right now, some of the young boys, when they get the two-wheeler, they want to do some stunt. As I was doing, standing on the scooter and riding, they want to do those things, I'm saying. If you cannot stop them, only thing is they should not be doing it on the street. We must create a space where they can do it with a reasonable amount of safety. Is it one hundred percent safe? No. Nothing is one hundred percent safe. All of us are mortal, isn't it? But we must create 
reasonable levels of safety where youth will go through adventure with the minimum amount of risk. No risk adventure, there is no such thing. I was one person, people were very surprised when I spoke for Jallikattu in Tamil Nadu. They said, Sadhguru, you cannot say this. I said, see, are you capable of building sports arenas in every village? Can you make them play football, this one, adventure sport, everything in the villages, can you? There's really nothing. The only thing that they have is a traditional sport where once a year they play, which is risky, of course, but it comes from a tradition of doing something. It's risky for the animal, it's risky for the man, actually more risky for the man than the animal. When I spoke for it, everybody resisted, you can't say this. I said, see, youth without any sense of adventure are not youth. You can always… you can already bury them as old men. They have to do something, but this does not mean they have to do wild things on the street. We can create situations and spaces where they can do this with reasonable amount of safety. There is no absolute safety. Some of the parents uh, who are here don't approve of this, but uh, otherwise they'll do it somewhere where you can't see. <laughs> this is one thing I noticed in uh, United States, especially we are… our center is in Tennessee, so I'm just seeing this. If you go to your shop, I, I go to your motorcycle shop and I see they made motorcycles for three-year-olds. They actually built motorcycles for them. Three-year-olds are riding full on in the dirt bikes. I thought this is great, parents are standing there fully helmeted, jacketed, everything. They're riding. This is great because this needs to happen. Otherwise, they will do something wild when they are fifteen, sixteen, without any training, without any preparation, without the safety equipment. Then we don't know how it'll end. Thank you, Sadhguru. Now, uh, the audience is very ecstatic about asking questions to you and now we open the floor for the audience. First question please. Hello, uh, I said Guru, uh, I'm Dheeraj, so… I, the microphone, you must hold it like Lady Gaga, like this <laughs> Hello, so my question is, we live in the times when uh, Artificial intelligence is poised to surpass human intelligence uh, and even fr people from the scientific community, they stand divided on this front that whether it will be proven as a threat or just an enhancement, as you spoke, even Elon Musk is skeptical about that. So what are your views upon it, like where do you stand? See, do you remember when they installed uh, lifting cranes and gantries in the ports of Bengal, the trade unions all protested, they're going to take away our jobs. Do you remember those times? There, that was a time where thousands of men would carry sacks out of a ship. One ship unloading means fifteen days, twenty-five days like this. Though they were, at that time the ships were much smaller, sacks, one one man carrying one one sack and all kinds of problems with it. Today, I was recently visiting one of the largest ports in the world in India, you must find out which one it is. And they told me, at two… right there they were unloading this uh, uh, vessel, it is at two hundred and twenty-five thousand tons. I asked, how long does it take to unload? They said, we have the record in the world that we unload a ship like this within twenty-four to twenty-six hours. Because the cranes and the gantries are such, they will lift that kind of weights and just put it out, everything is in a container, it's just coming out. But when these containers and lifts… Uh, these cranes came, the labor unions across the country protested because our jobs are going to be taken. I'm sure now they're all happy, they don't have to carry those bags. Similarly, if artificial intelligence comes, I'll tell you my experience of artificial intelligence. I was uh, probably twelve, thirteen years of age, thirteen I think. 
It's not like you people, all of you have smartphones and stuff, those days. Somebody shows me a flatbed calculator. Those days, only two companies making these calculators, at least in India, what was available, Sony and Panasonic. For this also to get it, you need Haji Mastan. He has to smuggle it in, otherwise you won't get it. <laughs> By normal means, you can't get it. <laughs> So, Sony was very expensive, hundred and twenty-five rupees. Panasonic, if you went and bargained in that so-called Hong Kong bazaar or Burma bazaar or whatever, you would get it for ninety rupees. So you buy this calculator and somebody brought it first time I am seeing. They do tuk 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 into tuk 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 tuk. I said, what? Why the hell are they torturing me in the mathematics classes? <laughs> when this stupid machine, ninety rupee machine can do this, why are they torturing me for ten, twelve years, teaching me how to add, how to multiply <laughs> So that day I sat and dreamt, if there was another machine like this for science, for chemistry, for physics, for everything, I don't have to come to school. <laughs> That was my dream. It's going to come true shortly. <laughs> See, it helps. It did not come true when I was going to school, but it's going to come true very shortly. Don't you find this Google lady, though you are in IIT, this Google lady seems to know more than you any given day? Hello? So it will come, what you are going to learn in twenty-five years of education is in this much gadget. Today there are phones with six hundred GB of memory. You are not a match for that, isn't it? So this is the problem with our education systems. This is a near… this is a terrible European influence on us that we have been made to believe, most human beings are believing that memory is intelligence. Memory is not intelligence, memory is just information. If you misunderstand information as intelligence, then we will… whole generations have paid a price for this, except a few human beings who spark in a big way in every generation till now, rest are all a big drag. I'm telling you, in every human being there is a genius. The question is, they must find the right habitat, right atmosphere for the genius to blossom. But right now, if you go on imposing loads and loads of memory on their heads, their genius will never spark because they misunderstand memory as intelligence. Because if you have some information that the guy next to you doesn't have and you just speak it out, he thinks he's a fool and you think you are smart. This is the difference between a city boy and a village boy. You know, a city boy is looking smart not because he's more intelligent, simply because he has more information in his head. So these people who have been faking intelligence for a long time, they are all going to become redundant once artificial intelligence comes because a stupid little machine is going to have more memory than you can ever imagine possible, all right? This… these are good times because what you remember in your mind will not decide who you are in the society. How much of a human being are you is going to determine who you are. I think fantastic times <clears throat> I think fantastic times for humanity is just about coming. I'm asking you, I'm asking you, suppose you were working in one of the ports in Bengal, and you were carrying those bags, heavy bags, back-breaking loads. And after hundred years you came back and saw all these loads are just being put, put, lifted and put on the truck just like that in two minutes, what you carried entire day. Would you not be fascinated and fantastic? That's how you will feel if after the artificial intelligence has come, you come, and you realize you don't have to go to school. 
you don't have to gather all this nonsense. All these idiots who read two books and acting very smart in the world, they will all go. You have to exercise your intelligence, otherwise you will not survive. It's great time. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Yes. Sir, I have a personal question, sir. My name is Abhay, sir. Sir, I want to ask, the, there is some event uh, that happens to my… that happens to me frequently. Whenever I go to somewhere, just like uh, department, if I go to department and uh, it happens very frequently, whenever I return, I… if I meet some person uh, while going, I meet the same person while coming. Uh, it is a random time, no? You… you must be going into the restroom. It happens very random. Even if I go uh, in the random time, uh, I meet the same person on the same path, sir. I don't know why this happens to me. From my childhood, I have been observing this. I don't know why, what is the answer of this? Why this happens to me? <clears throat> no, when I said restroom, I was not trying to say some bad place. This happened. It once happened. Shankaran Pillai got a job in Pentagon, you know, Pentagon? Where it is decided which country should live and which country should be destroyed and everything, big things. <laughs> so, he sat in his appointed office for a few days, then he moved his table and chair to the corridor and went to all the penta corners. After much moving around, as he was moving around, the entire Pentagon staff became suspicious. Is this some kind of a agent or somebody? Why is he moving his table and chair all over the place? His computer, his table and chair is moving all over the place. And then he settled down in the men's room. Then they thought, this is really something because this one place everybody goes, so, he's really up to something, they watched him, they checked his background, they checked his emails, they checked everything, they didn't find nothing wrong. Then they told uh, the Pentagon psychiatrist, just look up this guy, either he is a super spy or he's crazy, he must be something, just find out. Then the psychiatrist just walked into the men's room, as if he has to use it and pretend it to pee. Then casually stuck up a conversation and he's asked, why are you sitting in the men's room? Table, chair, computer, everything, why are you sitting here? He said, I moved all over Pentagon, but this is the only place where people seem to know what they're doing. <laughs> so, uh, Maybe your department. Today, I was not knowing that you were coming. Uh, when I was going to department, uh, I met one friend. But while returning from department, I met the same friend, not on the same uh, regular time. I uh, leave that to a random time. And he met me and told me that Sadhguru is coming. So, this happens to me from the uh, right <laughs> See, if you are in a specific department, you usually tend to meet the same people. <laughs> you must change the department and see you… <laughs> you'll see… <laughs> you'll meet different people. <laughs> I… I understand what the confusion is about. You seem to encounter the same people a bit too often. That will completely change when you leave the IIT and go out, <laughs> all right? Before that, it is like this, I will tell you, I have been… Uh, these days I am not doing a… live early on, my father is an ophthalmologist, okay? So, uh, he was giving glasses to so many people and various kinds of things. So, I discovered a simple method. There was one guy in, U in UK whose name was Bates. So he has a Bates method of improving vision. I saw this and I saw 
He had some sense and he had figured out a few things, but there were many things he had not figured out. I developed that into a different level. I took off spectacle, spectacles for thousands of people, people who had vision defects. Today they are all living, thousands and thousands of people who don't have glasses anymore. That includes my daughter. She's still living without a… without glasses. Early on when she was seven years of age, they prescribed glasses. My father being an ophthalmologist believes one hundred percent, once you have short sight or long sight, there is no way that you can take it away. This is the medical conclusion. But I can show you thousands of people who don't have glasses right now because they did certain things with themselves. In all this, I will just explain one thing. See, right now there's a crowd of people. You simply just look like this. You will see the faces that you know, somebody that you know, that face looks very clear, rest of them are just a blur. That out of the world <laughs> and we would like to see her, right? <laughs> People, because your vision is seriously aided by your memory. There are stories, we don't know to what extent because they were given to telling all kinds of stories. They say when the first ships from Europe went to uh, North America, the tribes saw the people but they could not see the ship. It took them some time to actually see the ship because there was no such form in their memory. You try this, those of you who have vision defects, take off your glasses, take a book and let's say you see one word, and you say, okay, this is uh, sun, 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 you build memory about it. And then you just look like this everywhere and look at it. You will see only that one word will come up to you, rest of the words are not so clear. So with faces also this is true. Once you have built memory about that, that face always stands out, the other faces don't show clearly. So it could be possible, ten people pass by, you don't pay much attention, but the face that you know, immediately you recognize, you immediately you notice that face to be there. <laughs> now this problem will be solved when you leave the institution <laughs> People are very enthusiastic about asking questions, but as we are running out of time, we would be taking one last yeah. question. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, I'm excited to talk. So, uh, my question is, uh, even if we are hundred uh, percent uh, sure about the internals, like if, uh, even if I'm hundred percent exuberant, but still we cannot uh, uh, get the opportunities we want and the luck factor is there in everybody's uh, life. So, is there somebody else like other, uh, from the other dimensions or uh, uh, other than the physical who's controlling it or is it, uh, is does the… Uh, does the life just happen like that? Like the luck factor and the opportunities we get, we cannot control it. What… what is the level of influence the stars have on you? No, 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 I'm not asking that. Like the opportunities… No, luck means usually people look at the stars. You look up and see in this building, there are a few stars, there's a constellation, just see, look up. <laughs> so how much role do they have? No, I'm not asking that, like… Uh, the opportunities we get are purely… I get you, I, I get you. So, who controls them and uh, can we control it? Mm -hmm. See, uh, if you have some mastery over your physical body, fifteen to twenty percent of your life and destiny will be in your hands. Suppose a given situation, let's say a tiger walked into IIT, Karagpur, so, somebody who is physically in a certain good state, within a moment they will climb up the tree, sit there and enjoy the wildlife <laughs> Yes? Because they have a certain mastery over their body. Somebody who doesn't have that becomes the breakfast <laughs> Isn't it so? Life and death. Because you're physically in a certain condition, you have some mastery over the body. You could be living, others could be dead, yes or no, in any given situation, it is true. Because you're physically good, maybe you'll catch the bus 
and somebody will miss the bus. And that missing the bus could be not just a actual physical thing, it could be metaphorical that you miss the bus because you're not physically fit. So fifteen to twenty percent of your life and destiny is determined depending on how much mastery you have over your body. If you just learn to sit right, breathe right, hold yourself right, believe me, so many things will happen your way. This is what yoga is about, that you make sure everything that you do with your body is by conscious will, not by accident, not by compulsive modes. You sit, eat, breathe in a conscious way. If you have mastery over your mental faculties, sixty to seventy percent of your life and destiny will happen your way. If you have mastery over your life energies, one hundred percent of your life and destiny will happen your way. And she is the boss sir here. I have gone through your most of your YouTube recordings, but I found that most of the questions which you are answering I got it, I got the question. No, I understand the question. Do I look like somebody who cannot understand the question, you have to explain it to me? <laughs> so, uh, there is an inner experience. Well, I'm… I'm glad you recognize that. It is the inner experience which makes life lucid, that is everything is not a struggle. If you picked up bits and pieces from so many people around you, if another piece comes which none of them gave, you'll be again confused eternally. So you will naturally structure your life… structure your life in such a way that your life becomes a cocoon where only expected things come your way, unexpected things don't come your way. This is what most human beings are doing because unexpected things are seen as googlies which will get them out. So, they try to remain within the known. If you remain within the known, life becomes extremely limited and it's incapacitating in many ways. All the human potential is lost. So, how to get an inner experience which makes your activity and the way you exist a more lucid experience of life? Well. YouTube videos are there, that is only uh, for lack of vocabulary, I would say that is only titillation. That is only to instigate you to look that there's another way to live, there's another way to structure your life, there's another way to build yourself as a human being. You want to become an engineer, you want to become a doctor, you want to become something else, that's a different thing, that's activity. For that you have to learn something outside. But what kind of a human being you want to be, this has to be done from within, there's no other way. For this, there's an entire scientific process which we call as inner engineering, which we will not import unless you come in a committed way. Because without commitment, these things do not happen. All we want from you is twenty-eight to thirty hours of focused time. But most people think their life is not worthy enough that they can invest twenty-eight hours of focus time. What can you do for such lives? Let them enjoy the YouTube. So people are saying, but there is a cost to it. Yes, because it's being physically delivered, there's a cost to it. We have come up with a plan probably by, uh, let us say, by sometime middle of 2019, we will be able to execute it where we can offer this without cost to people. We are looking at a plan like that. There are certain technological challenges, we are… if you overcome that in the next six to eight months, you will see inner engineering as a scientific process. Most of it, except the yogic part of it which needs to be initiated, except that all of it will be available to everybody free of cost in about sixteen different languages across the world.